Women's Day, when we talk about uh, women's empowerment or whatever, um, in journalistic parlance, we call it calendar journalism. And many editors will scoff at it, saying, what is this? Only one day you're going to talk about women or what? But I think it adds its value because you do some stock taking, you celebrate your victories, and you also talk about your failings and talk about what is, in what ways you're falling short. Uh, and that, I think, uh, is a great occasion to be able to do that. Uh, second thing, I, I apologize because I'm a little off today because I had, uh, I have an elderly mother who's Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and I was looking after her the whole night and the mother-in-law also. But I'm mentioning this because my mother-in-law is unwell, my mother was unwell and uh, we were doing it all through the night, whatever the medical things that needed to be done. If you mention this in a place of work, they'll immediately say these women, it's either the children or their home or their responsibilities which they are always talking about. So they will tend to label you and therefore you will tend to say, okay, let me not mention why I'm doing whatever I'm doing and go about uh, finishing your business. So that is one of the first lessons that you will learn. Uh, uh, professor was talking about, uh, sir was talking, Mr. Owen was talking about uh, the diplomats and ambassadors, the numbers rising. And uh, yesterday we were meeting with uh, the DGP of uh, Telangana, Mr. Anjini Kumar, and he was sharing a story. Imagine uh, he passed the IPS. IPS, as you know, uh, uh, All India Services is one of the toughest exams. And he was in Kiroriman, and one of his friends, he said, was in a uh, college which is called St. Stephen's, and it is one of the most reputed colleges in the country, uh, I would think. And uh, he said a friend of his, she also passed the IPS with the same marks, and her parents were actually professors in the university, and they didn't let her take up IPS. She had to drop out of IPS, and then she had to go and uh, sit one more year, and go for a service which is more suitable for women. That was the kind of uh, language. And another very senior officer shared that one of his colleagues, when he was being allotted women officers uh, to work with him, he said, no, they'll get pregnant. They'll, uh, you know, they'll take time off and their children are not well. So he said, immediately I told him, you have two daughters. Would you like that kind of a bias when they are being recruited in an office? So you're talking about people who are at the highest level carrying biases you know, while we are, while we celebrate, uh, you know, six months of maternity leave, many ways better than the Western world actually, more than a UK and a US, we have this maternity, that six months, we say paternity, 15 days and so on and so forth. In government service, you also get childcare leave of two years, which is all fantastic. But biases creep in when they are recruiting you or when they want to give you responsibility. And that's where, uh, that's where I think we need to start chipping at it and working at it. So I'm going to limit myself to media because there are many subject experts here who will be talking about what's happening. So uh, globally itself, if you were to see uh, the representation of women, I'm going to throw some figures, forgive me for that. In television, we usually don't do that unless you have support and keep it as minimal as possible when you're telling our stories. But I'm saying there was a research in some hundred countries about the content that is there in news stories. And they found that 46% of the stories actually has gender inequality built into the story. And there were about 6% uh, only which spoke about uh, gender equality. This is the kind of a thing you will have because the, uh, the, uh, what we always are looking for is diversity, equality, inclusion, all of which we always keep talking about as buzzwords. But unless that, that, that thing comes in, the kind of stories that are told, uh, whether gender oriented or otherwise, that is not going to change. So this is what I'm uh, quoting is from the Beijing platform for action and they say men still occupy 73 percent of all top management positions uh, when they had studied about 522 media houses across that's what they realized that 73 percent of the leadership is actually taken up by men and uh, films i'm sure there are other experts who are going to talk about it but even in films you have less than one third of all speaking characters in any film is actually woman. And that may not be most important either. And now we say, oh my God, everywhere we are seeing anchors and they're all women and more than half of our broadcast media is women. Uh, we say that, but in leadership positions, like uh, here it so happens that uh, the principal is very, very uh, uh, friendly and uh, friendly as in gender friendly and having so many people in leadership positions. But what we understand is that out of uh, <laughs> 55 countries, women have only 15% leadership positions. And if you look at it, in newspapers, it's less than 5%.
in uh, magazines 14%, TV channels 21%, leadership positions I am talking about. Leadership position is somebody who is an executive editor, uh, input editor, output editor. These are designations that you will learn soon how the hierarchy works in a news organization. Hopefully many of you will take up uh, the news space and uh, talk about these kind of issues as well. So uh, the only place where we are actually doing a little better is digital platforms where you have uh, more number of women. That also is not more number is only about 27% or 30%. The more women and more uh, in the leadership position as well. And of all the articles that are written, only one in four is written by a woman in English. And English you would think are the more very progressive uh, media as compared to any other thing. And in Hindi, it's less than 17% articles, news articles that are written by women. So you can see it's a very skewed kind of a thing. And more importantly, it's not just the number of journalists we're talking about because uh, you have to talk about the subjects and you have to also talk about who is the source of information and what are the male panels. I think uh, the BBC had a project, Project 5050 they called it. Very consciously they said we will bring in more women into our programs and about 500 programs I think they had a project through which they said we will increase women's representation in those programs and they very consciously did that to make women's voices more inclusive uh, within those uh, uh, parameters. And if you see uh, in, in India so called uh, you see women anchors on the leading channels uh, more than 50 percent 54 percent actually is all male panels exclusively male panels that they speak to and in hindi it gets worse there are about 73 percent is all male panels when you're discussing any subject of importance <coughs> of course journalists are always complaining saying that we are given so called soft beats uh, we are asked to do entertainment you are asked to do lifestyle choices we are asked to do gardening or anything else which is in the women women's category are not allowed to do hardcore Yesterday I met with an anchor who said that she is doing all, uh, all political, political debates. Now you see increasingly more number of women. But the statistics tell you a different story. Even though they seem very visible to us because they are anchors. But in leadership positions, they are very few. And uh, as an example, I would think uh, uh, I have worked for this organization called NDTV for about since 1998. And we had a woman as the leader. I know you are not born then. <laughs> So we had, uh, we had a woman leading the organization and I think that made a lot of difference about in, in how women were treated and what kind of positions they were given within the organization. And I'm not talking about positive reservation that they did or said that we will recruit women instead of men and so on. They found them good workers. They were done purely on merit. But I'm saying they were not stopped from taking any positions because they, uh, they came, they, they were women or they were... Uh, you know, having other responsibilities at home or would become pregnant as some people tend to put it. So even now in journalism you have only about 35% are women and uh, that is in digital media only as I spoke to you about. And internationally also if you were to talk about it, again uh, the same position continues and uh, whether I mentioned the project 5050 that came about. Uh, I think ma'am will speak about our own experience. There is a global media monitoring project which has done a thing with network of women in media. And that also has some very disturbing statistics and figures that it throws up about where we are going as women within media. I have been uh, uh, a journalist for 33 years now. I spent time with the Times of India and then with the Economic Times and then moved to uh, television when it began. The first 24-7 uh, channel in India was... Uh, uh, NDTV. We used to do it on a platform called Star News at that time and we were the first private news channel in India. Otherwise there is only Doodashin. None of you will know there is only one person sitting in the studio who would read out whatever happens and uh, there would be no reporting from the ground. That's what it was in 1988 when uh, there was a very popular program called The World This Week which brought you news from across the world and I think the first standards of um, journalism in many senses in India were set by uh, that couple, Pranoy Roy and uh, Radhika Roy, who then went on to do this first private channel and I think many people were learning to emulate that. Ours was perhaps the first channel also where we could do women oriented stories, women subject stories or politics with women angle or you could be doing environmental change and that would have a women, woman angle. I find, I find a big advantage also in being a woman because you uh, one, that you get access uh, to people, you get access into homes and you are able to see their lives. So I am saying it is an advantage being a woman because you bring with it many other qualities which give you better access uh, into people's lives and to be able to, for them to be able to open up to you to tell those stories. And I think uh, 
one of the most empowering things for me has been to be able to report on these uh, on these women who showed their own uh, uh, their own journey of tenacity hard work merit as well not on anyone's charity but i, I find uh, you know just the other day we were meeting with some 150 women journalists in hajj park in telangana and you realize that each of them come from such diverse backgrounds and not necessarily backgrounds of privilege they are not coming from you know necessarily <coughs> elite schools or something and these women have had those kind of journeys to get where they have got and I think that's why it's very important that more and more when you have women coming from different backgrounds, you have different kinds of stories that are told and we don't make only an urban middle class woman as the, as the, uh, you know, as the person who represents women in India because there are many, many multiple tools to it and uh, I'd love to share uh, some of those stories which have been uh, telling those stories of women uh, and their journeys has been very empowering for me personally. Because I realize that these women, if they are able to do it, the role models that come out of these kind of stories, breaking stereotypes, and uh, that has been very empowering for me personally. Because you, you think, what can I do simply as a journalist? But then you realize that you know, telling those stories and the journeys that those, I'll tell you one story at least, uh, two. Let me uh, put it this way. I've been covering farmers' uh, suicides for a long time. There is a, there's been a tra tradition of a huge input cost, the chemicals, fertilizers, all of them increasing the cost and there was a shift to cotton, uh, you know, from synthetic pyrethroids, they went into other kind of things which all led to farmers distress and there has been huge numbers, we all know about it, that there is huge agricultural distress and I have been tracking some of these widows who don't even know that whether her husband has a bank account, how much is your uh, debt and so on and so forth and then they take the reins of the family and start running, she does farming, she does everything. So one lady for instance, Mallama, her children were in primary school when uh, the husband died, that was in 2000 and 2001. And then how she brought them up by herself and children are now in positions, one of them has got married, she has kids as well, but I'm saying the other children have uh, reached somewhere, she has been able to do uh, things with them with Perhaps the man gave up, the woman didn't. She had even worse circumstances than the man in terms of not knowing about agriculture and so on. So longitudinal studies we have done uh, over 10, 20 years of these kind of women which tell you how that, uh, that farmer in uh, Varangal, in Telangana, how her life was affected by international kind of uh, cotton price changes. What is happening you know, in another cotton growing country and how it affected, how it fluctuated and how it affected this little farmer in uh, in uh, Telangana. So I'm seeing many of those stories. We have done uh, these stories of children being sold, uh, babies being sold. Uh, this time, you know, there were adoption agencies, so to speak, who were buying store, buying children from very very impoverished families, and they were getting exported out of the country because those happened to be tribal children. Very very, uh, should I say, I mean, in Indian. Uh, in the Indian idea, this idea of a fair child is something that is much sought after. Skeletally very strong and fair children, they were, uh, they, were, uh, they were being exported. But how the policies, you know, the government then brought about a policy which said that you give us the child, you don't, uh, you don't have to you know, give it away, you don't have to kill the child. Infanticide and feticide, all of you would have heard about. You give us the child, we'll start bringing it up. And then I went back to some, uh, to some one, what is it called, a shishu vihar. And he found just in 15 days, there were 23 baby girls that had been dumped there. And then we went back to trace the families because the families, it was now legal to abdicate a baby. There's a, uh, something called abdication law. They said, nahi, is bari nahi hua, next time ho jayega. So every time you are dumping babies to, to, so that uh, you can next have a male child. So these kind of journeys, and then I, just to finish, wrap it up because I continue telling <laughs> these kind of stories, I'm saying, Afterwards what happened was people were physically buying babies, afterwards you had uh, technology coming in and uh, people actually told me when we did a sting operation, the government decided to take over adoption and uh, do it in adoption homes, inside government run adoption homes and I walked in like a couple wanting a baby and they said, uh, I said there is this, you know, biometrics and the names of the babies are there, how are you going to account for it if you are going to give me, you can pick any baby and walk out this wall, they told me. So I said, how am I going to do that? She said, this child is called Lavanya. The next child who will come, we'll call her Lavanya. So the account books look very perfect that your number of children has not changed. And you can uh, keep dealing with whoever comes and over the counter, you can buy a baby and come. And then a few more years, uh, when we did another sting operation, you realize that these babies, they told me that you don't have to come back because we will send you WhatsApp pictures of these babies and you can choose which baby you want. 
and we will do it. And the next stage was, you all know about you know these uh, vans that would go into villages to find out the sex determination of these uh, fetuses while they are still in the fetus, they will go and they do that. Now what is happening, they do the scanning and then they know it's a female baby, so you book a baby. My delivery of my baby will happen in July, so I can book for the baby much before. So all these stories that happen and then you realize there are women who are working against it, standing up for what they need and also I remember that such kind of a one rescue that we did of a baby which we went to buy and then I came to the police station because the handover etc. had to be done. There was a woman who had come there and she's uh, already had two children and she was a uh, breastfeeding mom and this was a tiny little baby that had been given away sold. She said, no, I'm, I, I want to breastfeed this baby. Usually there's a sentimental thing about, you know, people don't breastfeed other, another woman's child or something. She said, no, 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 till the child is there, I'm going to breastfeed uh, the baby to help uh, the child survive. So these are little, little, little things that you see and learn and understand and uh, realize that these are empowering stories of women who take initiative and come and uh, do that. And I'm, uh, Sir was talking about talking within the family as well. Stand up for everyone that you know, uh, not just a woman, but uh, all the more so for if you're a woman, nothing will go wrong. Nothing will go wrong. You stand for what you are, slowly people will fall in line. Even, in, even at homes where they resist girls taking up certain professions or certain kind of uh, things. When as long as you know, that uh, this is my dream and this is what I want to do. So chase it and uh, live your dream because you will regret it otherwise all, all, all of your life. Thank you so much.